Hey everyone and welcome back to the Retro Channel. Today we're going to be doing some upgrades to the Atari 65XE. Now I've got a ROM upgrade and a RAM upgrade in mind. Um, with the RAM upgrade I'm actually doing a 320k upgrade. The most popular upgrade these days seems to be the ultimate one megabyte upgrade. But to be honest there's not a lot of things that can take advantage of that. And I wanted to do something that had more time period correct parts involved. Uh, so no FPGAs or anything like that. Now to do this I'm just using some 30 gauge wire, a EEPROM programmer, we've got eight 41 256 kilobit RAM chips, a GAL 16 V8 that we'll need to program, and a 74 LS95, and just a couple of small value resistors. So um, let's open up the Atari and get this installed. All right, so looking inside, we've already got our sockets for the RAM, the GAL, and the Logic chip. That was just to save some time prior to filming. I also had to lift a pin, which is pin six on the MMU, and we'll get to why that is later. So all we need to do now is pop all these little RAM ICs in and then do some wiring. Okay, our RAM's in. Now, obviously, if you don't have a board that has the spots for the RAM, this upgrade may not work. Uh, I think there are some models that don't have the spots for the extra RAM bank. There are some models that use 4-bit, 64-kilobit RAM chips, so you've probably only got two of them rather than the full eight that we've got here. The other thing to do is to program the GAL. Now, I'll link in the description the file that I used to program it. Uh, this mod was done by, I think it's Jürgen, and I might be pronouncing that wrong, uh, who seems to be pretty popular among the Atari forums and has been around in the scene for quite a while. So I'll link that down below. One thing I did notice when programming this chip was that the Mini Pro software wanted to encrypt the chip after it programmed it, and I had to set that to off or disable that option just to, so I could verify that the chip was programmed correctly afterwards. I'm not sure what happens if you leave that option on and install it in the Atari. I assume that it still works, but yeah, I, I switched that off just so I could actually verify the chip afterwards. And I also took the time while I was there to make sure this LS95 was actually functioning. So once the GAL was programmed, we just need to lift pins 789 and 12 and 13, just bend them up flat, and we can install that in this new socket here. You will need sockets for the RAM chips, the GAL and the 74LS, and probably a socket for the MMU because it's usually soldered directly onto the board, so keep that in mind. Let's put our 74LS95 in, and then it's just a matter of doing a little bit of wiring and installing a couple of these little resistors. So let's get that done. We'll pop the board out, which isn't screwed in because I don't have any screws for it. So the first thing we need to do is connect pin one of all these RAM ICs together and they go through a 33 ohm resistor to pin 12 of the GAL, which is the first lifted pin on the top row. So let's get that done. Okay, now you'll notice I didn't strip the wire for any of the other pins. I literally just burnt through it with the soldering iron. I'm just going to go back through and just touch all that up with some fresh solder. Just to make sure we've got a good connection. Um, that is... 
I don't want to say a lazy way because it's still effective, but you definitely want to make sure that you've got those solder joints still nice and clean and not clogged up with bits of insulation from the wire. So I'm pretty happy with how they all look. I don't see any issues along here. That one might go, might do with a little bit of extra solder there just to make sure. That looks good. That looks good. And make sure we've got pin one on all these. So it should be every sort of second row. That looks good. So the next thing to do is run it back through the board. Now, originally on these boards, where this gal sits, there's usually three resistors. They're actually just zero ohm resistors, so they're really just jumpers. They all need to come out, obviously, to put the socket in, but it does reveal a small hole in the board, which we can actually use to run this 30 gauge wire through. That should keep everything looking pretty neat. Make sure we don't snag this on any of the other pins sticking through the board. Might just sort of route it under there. Might be worth adding a little bit of capped on tape just to hold that in place, but that's good enough for now. All right, let's put this, make sure I get the right one, 33 ohm resistor on pin 12 here. Might go that leg. Right. And then we're going to connect this wire to the other side. I might just trim it down a little bit more. Just somewhere around there. Just tin this side of the resistor. My fingers are too fat. Right, that's secure. It's not going to short to anything else. Cool. That's probably the hardest part done. The rest is just hooking up a couple of extra wires to run these signals from the gal to the correct places. So one of them goes to the MMU uh, and two wires go over to the PIA. So first up, pin seven of the gal needs to go to pin 16 of the PIA. I'm just going to run that across the top of the board. Um, Something like that. Let's just go that much. And that should be our pin 16, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. Okay. This is going to route over here somewhere and I might just use a couple of these resistors to keep it neat. And we're going to cut this back here. Don't forget to get all the offcuts of wire off the board. Okay, pin 8 needs to go to pin 17 of the PIA. Okay, pin 9 actually enables or disables the extended RAM, so 
If it's connected to ground, then this is disabled. And if it's connected to plus five volts or it's just left floating, this should be enabled. Now, just to be sure, I'm gonna just connect this to plus five volts as there's a convenient spot nearby. Um, just to make sure there's no issues and it's definitely going to be enabled and it's going to run just to the edge of this resistor here which has our 5 volt rail on it Alternatively, if you want to disable it, there's a ground point just here. So that's that. I'm just going to trim off that tiny bit of wire there. Hopefully not we'll lose it somewhere else on the board where it shorts something out. Okay, I'm pretty sure you can guess where pin 13 is going to go to, uh, as there's only really one location left that hasn't been soldered to yet. So let's do that. Ooh, still warm. Nothing to do with the 74 LS95, it just needs to be in the board. So that should be it. The instructions aren't fully clear, there is mention in one of the instructions of having a 3 or a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor between pin 16 and pin 20 of the PIA. So I'm going to stick that in just in case. Um, I don't see it doing any harm. So I think it's acting as a pull up resistor if pin 20 is 5 volts. Actually, I'm pretty sure the instructions just say put a resistor between pin 16 and plus 5. So pin 20 on the PIA is a convenient source for plus 5. And if I had it bent the leads properly, we should be able to do this without needing to put any heat shrink wrap on it. Okay, not my prettiest work, but that's connected. Right, that should be it. Let's uh, power this on and try it out. All right, so the board is back in the case. I've got video hooked up. I've also got a SIA to SD hooked up. And I borrowed a keyboard from an Atari 130XE because I'm still waiting on the replacement Mylar for the original keyboard. So this one at least works. Let's power it on and see what happens. So because I've got the SIA to SD already connected, it's set to automatically boot into our file browser. So let's just load up system info and we'll just check, see how much RAM it's reporting. So it's saying we've got 62K of conventional RAM and 256K of banked RAM for a total of 318K. So that looks about right. This is a pretty handy program and I'm going to come back to it shortly because we're going to do some benchmarks with the original ROM versus the new ROM replacement. So we'll come back to that in a minute. For now, I'm just going to load up BombJack because it's a game that requires you to have 320K available. And if you don't have 320K, it'll actually give you an error during loading that just tells you you need a system with at least 320K. So in theory, this should load up just fine and we should be able to have a quick play. So that looks good. I do like the little soundtrack. Um, I'm sure the pokey chip is getting a bit of a workout there. Let's try loading a demo and I guess the most popular one is Newman. So I think that only requires 256K. So um, yeah, let's load that up and see how it goes. All right, that looks good. So I'm pretty confident that our RAM upgrade is working. Let's go back and swap out the ROM. All right, so it appears that our 320K upgrade is working just fine. The next upgrade that I wanna do is the ROM upgrade. 
Now this one comes from a user on Atari age and we just need to obviously socket the OS ROM and burn a new one to a 128K EEPROM. Now I'll put a link again in the description. Um, this is the third version of that ROM. Um, there are a couple of other versions in that thread, but I'm using basically the, the final version. What this should give us is a few added bonuses. So the first thing I want to look at is back in the sysinfo program and checking out the floating point operations. So the original ROM, everything pretty much sits at 99, uh, but with this replacement ROM, it actually speeds up a lot of those operations. So it averages about twice the speed. Um, now I don't actually know what the real world benefit would be to that um, because most games don't see any performance improvement. So if anyone who's knowledgeable with Atari 8 bits knows the actual benefits of that, um, yeah, leave a comment down below. I'd be interested to find out. But while we're in here, we can check out the hard disk read speeds. So with the original ROM, we had everything pretty much stuck at twos. And with this replacement ROM, which includes high speed SIO routines, uh, we're seeing about a four times improvement on that. So a couple of eights, seven and nine. So that's a really good improvement. So of course I wanted to check this out loading BombJack. It took ages to load. Uh, with the original ROM routines, so I'm hoping these high-speed SIO ones will speed that up. But unfortunately what happened instead is it actually crashed during loading. Now I think this is actually down to the fact that the high-speed SIO routines do have to occupy a small bit of RAM as well. So I think in terms of the bomb jack loader, it's actually overriding that little bit of RAM or corrupting it somehow, and that's just messing up the whole loading routine. So unfortunately, this ROM upgrade doesn't seem to work with BombJack and also tested out with Pang, um, which is another game that requires 320K and it also crashed. The good news is everything else still seemed to work. So I tried out the Newman demo again and it loads about three times as fast. So. There is some correlation between those numbers that we're seeing in the sysinfo program and real world performance. So given that it only breaks two games and from the testing that I've done, everything else still seems to work just fine and it's got a huge speed increase. I'm thinking I'm just gonna leave this ROM in here for now. Now I did mention back at the start of this video that there is the ultimate one meg upgrade and that actually allows you to switch ROMs uh, without opening up the system. So in a way that's probably better in this situation because you know obviously I can switch back and forth between ROMs if I find one that doesn't play nicely uh, with a certain game. But given that that's a hundred bucks and the money that I spent on this is a fraction of that I'm not too concerned. It may be something that I'll look at in the future, but I'm pretty happy with how this is running so far. I mean, the Atari library has got a massive amount of games. Most of them were designed just for 48 and 64K of RAM available. And it's really only the 130XE that games got started getting produced for 128K. So I can still play all of those legacy games it's just a couple of 320k games that refuse to run with this particular rom so i'm not too concerned i'm i'm happy just to leave it in and and let those games go obviously i've already had a good play of them off camera anyway so no big deal one other little benefit of this rom is that it actually swaps the default boot behavior so with the xl and the xe series they have basic built in the problem with that is a lot of games don't like having basic running before they actually start booting. So games like Yump here and also even that sysinfo program, you actually have to hold option to disable basic before you start loading the program. With this ROM that function is swapped so you don't hold option 
and that disables basic and when you do hold the option key that enables basic. So pretty much regardless of whatever you try and load with this ROM, it'll just work without you having to intervene. Now, a final little thing that is recommended is to remove C77 and C78 when you're using high-speed SIO routines. Uh, it just pretty much squares up the waveform uh, of the SIO information coming in and out. So C77 and C78, I've just clipped one side of them and lifted them off the board slightly. I might put some heat shrink over them, but you don't really need to remove them entirely as long as they're not um, in circuit anymore. So yeah, that is the 320K RAM upgrade and the OS ROM upgrade. All right, so there you go. A couple of neat and very budget-friendly upgrades for this 65XE. I think all up the parts cost me probably under 10 bucks. There is a little bit more that I want to do with the 65XE, but I think we'll have to leave it here as I'm sure the video is getting quite long by now. But I will mention that I do want to look at some video output upgrades. This one currently has the RF modulator removed and I believe the super video upgrade has been done to it, but it's still not great. I mean, the XE models are known for pretty rubbish video output quality, and there is the UAV or Ultimate Atari video mod, um, but it is quite expensive to ship to Australia. So I'm thinking of trying something out myself, and that'll come up next time we look at this machine. One more thing that I was curious about is the badge. This is the original 65XE badge that was on this machine and it's, it's, it's all kinds of messed up, which is why I replaced it with the current one, which is just a, a silver and black 65XE. Now, looking at the website the other day, there is actually one with the red Atari logo, which is a bit more um, fitting with the original badge, but they do also have one that has the red Atari logo and 320XE. Now given that this has got the 320K upgrade, I'm curious to know what you'd think would be better. Should I go with this badge like it is, the red version of this badge, or should I go all out and put the 320XE badge on here? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and uh, I think we should wrap this up. So. A big thanks to my patrons, as always, some of which you'll see appearing on the screen right now. If you're interested in becoming a patron of the channel, um, be sure to check out the links below. You'll get ad-free early access to videos, along with a bunch of other little benefits. And uh, if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to the channel, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching the Retro Channel. Bye.